Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for CHCI's session on education, preparing Latino students for an unpredictable future. My name is Dennis Gonzalez and I am the Director of Leadership Programs at CHCI since 2018. Before we begin our panel, it is my distinct privilege to welcome our panel host, Congressman Raul Grijalva, our session sponsor, Maureen Reyes from College Board, and our moderator, Tony Tejerino from the Hispanic Heritage Foundation. Congressman Raul Grijalva represents the 3rd Congressional District of Arizona, which includes the city of Tucson and 300 miles of the U.S.-Mexico border. He is the chair of the Natural Resources Committee. He serves on the Committee on Education and Workforce and is the Chairman Emeritus of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. He has always fought for underrepresented voices, including the fight to reform our broken immigration system and ensure livable wages for American workers. We also have remarks from Maureen Reyes, Executive Director of the College Board. Maureen is responsible for Advanced Placement AP Program Management Strategy and Research. Recently, she helped establish the AP Computer Science Principles, the largest course launch in AP's 60-year history. This panel will bring together representatives from across the education sector, including teachers, unions, nonprofits, and colleges of education. To help us moderate this important and timely session, we are delighted to have Antonio Tijerino, who is the president and CEO of the Hispanic Heritage Foundation. The foundation focuses on education, workforce, leadership, and culture through service and innovation. It is an impact-focused organization boasting a network of 150,000 vetted 15 and 35 year old Latinos mobilized in the tech and STEM fields, entrepreneurship, finance, and media. I hope you enjoy this session and don't forget to continue the conversation on social media using the hashtag CHCIHHM20. And now without further ado, Congressman Grijalva. Thank you very much. And I want to thank CHCI for the leadership conference and the for the kind invitation to be part of this uh, introduction of this panel. Uh, the topic is preparing Latino students for an unpredictable future. Uh, very apropos and very timely. You know, public schools in the U.S. is where over, the overwhelming uh, number of uh, Latino students attend school. And we were, we were confronting pre-existing conditions, budget so shortfalls, underfunding, the constant struggle to close the achievement gap, the need to close the digital divide in terms of technology and access uh, to uh, the information highway, facilities improvements, and uh, issues related to a community, poverty, uh, lack of health care, and employment. All these challenges were with us before the pandemic, and then the pandemic hit, and these pre-existing conditions got worse. And what has happened? We've had a failed response on the part of Trump and his administration. DeVos at the Department of Education, where no additional funding is, has, has been forthcoming to the schools other than the CARE Acts, which is not enough. And the pandemic has, has exposed some realities that all of us in this room knew about and, as, and part of this call, that there is disparate and disproportional impact on Latino communities, that the digital divide is real that the widening achievement gap needs to be closed and we have to make sure that we don't have permanent setbacks as a consequence of the pandemic. Five million English learners, layoffs of school personnel, and when Latinos are the last hired, they're usually the first ones that have to leave. Legislation is, is, uh, is available uh, to the Republican majority in the Senate and to this administration. The House of Representatives passed the HEROES Act. 915 million of budget stabilization, 150, 160 billion uh, going to education to prepare for the proposed reopening that the Trump administration demands. Targeted responses under with Title I and Title III for our students. But overall, this is the beginning of, uh, of something that I think is very important, that going back to the status quo in, for Latinos in education is not enough. That is not going to solve the, the issues and the challenges that we're confronting for an unpredictable future. The unpredictable future has to do with the lack of investment and, and new strategies that are necessary uh, for our students uh, going into the future. 
And this panel uh, has the expertise to talk about that. But as I said before, this pandemic has exposed the reality, uh, the lack of equity and equality when it comes to Latino education in this country. And it has also exposed the reality that we cannot simply put back things the way they were. That it has to be different, it has to be better, and it has to be a serious investment in our students. Looking forward to the panel, to their comments and their perspectives. And again, CHCI, thank you very much. Hello, my name is Maureen Reyes. I work for the AP program at the College Board, and we are thrilled to be a part of the CHCI 2020 Leadership Conference and this critical conversation about education challenges impacting the Latinx community. The College Board is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to ensure that all students are connected to college success and opportunity. We have several initiatives to ensure that Latinx students have the opportunity to pursue rigorous courses and earn college degrees that lead to meaningful careers and successful lives. One example of this is our new AP Computer Science course that launched four years ago with the goal of increasing the diversity of students who pursue computer science as a career. We need a tech industry that welcomes a broader array of talent, and that begins with recruiting students traditionally underrepresented in computer science. When the course launched four years ago, we committed $200,000 to professional development scholarships to teachers from Latinx majority schools to ensure that talented students had access to rigorous computer science courses. We're proud to say that the Latinx AP computer science participation has increased by 350% over the last four years, benefiting both those students and the tech industry that badly needs them. Work like this matters because we know there are students who have the skills and the talent, but simply may not have access to the right classes. We are thrilled with the growth of Latinx students participating in AP courses over the last 10 years and are eager to do more. Latinx AP participation has nearly tripled over the last decade, and in the class of 2019, they were more likely to take AP than their white peers. We're proud to be a part of this work and inspired by your dedication to your communities. Enjoy the conference. Good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. I'm Antonio Tijerino with the Hispanic Heritage Foundation, and we are proud partners of CHCI and friends of Marco Davis. So it's my privilege to be part of this important panel today. Uh, thank you, Congressman Grijalva. Your words are always powerful, and our sponsor speaker, Maureen Reyes from the College Board for their opening remarks and setting a great tone for this conversation we're about to have here. I also wanna take a moment to thank Apple, the NEA and the Walton Family Foundation for their support of CHCI in this particular panel. And thank you to CHCI for hosting this leadership conference overall and deciding to focus attention on the important topic we're gonna to address today, education, preparing Latino students for an unpredictable future, which has just become even more unpredictable. Schools in the US face the challenge of preparing students for rapidly evolving world needs ushered through advances in artificial intelligence and innovative technologies. As we've all experienced, schools across the U.S. have had to quickly adopt to COVID-19 pandemic and massive school closures that could change how schools educate future generations of Latinos. We also know that Latino students in particular face bigger challenges than most because of the digital divide. This panel will address how our schools can embrace a shift to more creative teaching responses in the realities of 2020 and beyond to more effectively prepare Latino students for thinking critically, solving complex problems, and engaging better with their subject matter. I'm delighted to be joined today by three real subject matter experts on this topic. First, please welcome Carrie Rodriguez, president of the National Parents Union. Carrie's impact extends beyond the National Parents Union as an elected member of Massachusetts Democratic State Committee serving on the executive committee of the Ethnic Council of the Democratic National Committee and advisory board of Democrats for Education Reform. Next, we welcome Susan Chavez, who is an assistant superintendent for the Los Lunas school system in New Mexico. She is in her 20th year in education and has spent her entire career working for the Los Lunas schools as a teacher, an inclusion support coach, and an educational diagno diagnostician and administrator. 
We're finally pleased to round out the panel with Robert Rodriguez, an executive committee member for the National Education Association. During his 14 years of teaching, Robert has worked at the elementary, middle school, and special day class and resource specialist levels. He believes that the only organization, or, and oh, I'm sorry, he believes that only organized and collective action can affect lasting change for educators. I just want to get to something else too. Um, on the Q&A, if any of you want to ask our panelists a question, please type it into the Q&A box, and you can also upvote other people's questions. So welcome panel, thanks for joining us. And I'm gonna jump right in with my first question, which is for all of you. Um, help us briefly set the context for the key challenges that Latino students face nationally for learning and education during this pandemic. And why don't we go with Carrie first, then Susan, then Robert. Well, it's a, a difficult moment uh, for families across the country, but especially for Latino families. We were already behind the eight ball. It was already a very difficult situation where we faced the achievement gap and our children being generationally underserved by a system that is mired by systemic racism and was never really set up to serve our children. Uh, so this is a moment of unprecedented challenge, but also a moment of unprecedented opportunity. So families across the country are looking to this moment to uh, certainly do what we can to support our children moving forward, but also hold our systems accountable so that whatever learning loss is suffered, uh, it is not going to put our kids so far behind uh, that they are no longer capable of the bright future that we have promised them. So it's our job as adults to step up to the plate and get it done for our kids. Uh, and this is our moment that we've got to really make sure uh, that we are focused on equity issues for our Latino children across the country. Susan. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us here today. I agree with Carrie. It is all about the equity. We are in a position to change education's future as we know it. I'm so excited that we are actually bringing this to the forefront. It's time. Our students need us. We do need to stand for our students. And I do think one of the major challenges that we do face as educators is really ensuring that our students have equal access to the education we are providing currently. And Robert? Buenos dias y bienvenidos. I'm Robert Rodriguez, and I completely agree with my other panelists here uh, that bring up forward what we're seeing. The COVID-19 pandemic has really put forward the inequities and disparities we're seeing uh, within our public school as well as within the Latino community. What we're seeing goes far beyond the needs for access in the digital divide. We're seeing huge systemic institutional racism that exists in healthcare, the workplace, and housing. And we know that our students need all of those various components, those needs met in order to be successful in our schools. And what we've also seen within our community is that people are coming together. You see parents, you see students, and you see community leaders really embracing from food drives to technology drives to coming up with opportunities to provide healthcare access within the communities that we need. And we have to push forward. Um, I, like like Congressman, Congressman Grijalva said earlier, our, our legislators have passed the HEROES Act and we need to continue moving forward legislation to bring in the necessary resources that our communities desperately need in order to bridge this divide that we have right now in order to increase educational opportunities for Latinos. Yeah, and let's not forget those other nuances as well in terms of the mental health issues within our communities um, dealing with this pandemic. I've can't work from home, so the parents are under additional strain and all of that um, has an effect on, on our students. Uh, thank you all for those uh, that wonderful context. So now that we've had a chance to paint a clearer picture of the unique context for Latino students, what will we need to do differently, especially in the ways that we educate our students? So my, my, my second question is, how do the changes being implemented in school systems during the pandemic change how we think about educating the current and next generation of Latino students this year and in years to come? Uh, again, let's start with um, Susan and anyone else that wants to weigh in on that, then we can go to Carrie and then Robert, switch it up a little bit. 
So I do think that we're teaching a very different generation than what was taught when I was in school. I know that our students are different learners. They are not the same learners that we were. And as educators, we need to understand that. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we face as educators. Our students are tech savvy. They are swiping before they learn how to talk in some instances. And so it's really important that we are able to bring that challenge-based learning to the forefront. We have an amazing partnership with Apple in our district. All of our students, we are very, very, very lucky. We have one-to-one -one devices. So pre-K through 12th grade, all of our students have devices. So as we move forward with our the way that our generations are gonna come after us, we need to incorporate technology and challenge-based learning into what we do and how can we impact our communities. I think our students that we're teaching today have a greater responsibility to take care of their grandparents, to take care of our community. So I do think we need to rise to that challenge and understand that our learners are not who we were when we were in the school position they're in. Shout out Apple, the sponsor. Carrie. Um, this is also a transformative moment for Latino families to engage in a new level of power uh, in the conversations we have around education. For too long, there has been an indictment of parents generally, but especially in the Latino community, that, you know, because we don't show up the way that is expected in some systems that, you know, we don't care about our children, we're not engaged, um, we're not participating. And nothing could be farther from the truth. We are the mamas who are out there working two or three jobs, trying to make sure that our children uh, have a better life than we had. Uh, but those conversations are changing because the fact of the matter is, especially when we talk about kids in, in K through six grades, um, Parents have to be the facilitators of education. We are seeing more and more, we have more information about how our kids learn, uh, what, what the best environment is for our kids to learn, what, what, they, what they know, what they don't know, what they need to know. And, and right now, parents are also the curators of a lot of the, the curriculum happening in homes right now. So we have a lot of information. We also have a lot of power. For the first time, we're being told not just to, to get what you get and not get upset with whatever it, whatever is being presented from the system, but we also have the power to choose. Now, all of a sudden, uh, there are a whole host of options in front of us, and we've seen that, that choice is possible and that we are able to select what is best for our children when for so long we've been told uh, we're not smart enough uh, and, and we're not capable to make those kinds of decisions. Now the choice is in our hands, and frankly, uh, we're excited about the opportunity we have to uh, introduce new things and new options to our children. That being said, it's also a very difficult time because, again, those two, three jobs still have to be done for us to care for our families. It is a time of stress. And what we really need to do is to look to Congress and to look uh, to the federal government to provide a family stimulus to make sure we are being protective of the fabric of our families in this nation during this time of unprecedented challenge. Thank you, Carrie. Robert, did you want to weigh in? I do. I think I think it's important to also note that that this is or remind folks that this is a difficult time for everyone, for our families and our communities, for our students that are struggling to learn, and for our educators as well. Um, you know, our members have had to switch on a dime's notice, and within uh, weeks, they had to move everything from the classroom to the clouds. And we've learned a lot between the time from when the first shutdowns began to happen in my home state early on in March until the, the open, reopening of schools. And it's important to remind our community and our families and our friends that our schools are not closed. They're just in a different way. They're online, they're hybrid, and some of them are in person with the appropriate uh, safety standards put in place for students. And I think what we learn from that is when we do resume to, resume to some form of normalcy in life, our world has completely changed. And we have to learn to embrace different models of how we structure our communities and schools. And that's actually a strategy that we like to advertise within the National Education Association about bringing parents, about bringing business owners, community leaders, and educators all together at the table to talk about what's working. Um, I think it's exactly the well point stated earlier that what the pandemic has done is brought us back together as partners in the learning process. While we can provide all of the devices, uh, hotspots, 
curriculum to send home, virtually teaching from the from a computer screen. It's still that home connection from parents and guardians that we have to work on embracing to ensure that that learning progresses and continues. Absolutely. Parents play a key role in this. What are some ways we can ensure Latino students will develop more critical thinking and problem solving skills in highly tangible and engaging ways? Um, uh, Carrie, do you want to start us off here and then anyone else can weigh in if you if you'd like? Well, you know, I, I think this is kind of a funny question because we're often asked, you know, how much learning is being lost right now? And I, I would contend that in the Latino community, especially, we are blessed because regardless of whether we're in school or not, we're always learning. Uh, my children are spend, have spent a lot of time with Abuelita uh, to learn a different set of skills uh, but that are still incredibly valuable. Just because our kids might not be in a public school building during this time does not mean that we are not growing and evolving and problem solving. If anything, uh, we are learning critical lessons and who better than us who uh, have been able to overcome so many different unprecedented challenges in the past and we're calling upon that expertise in our heritage in this moment to know that we will persevere. Uh, we are so good at figuring things out. And, and thankfully, we have our ancestors with us to guide us through these moments. But um, to say that we're not learning, uh, you know, we're not learning grit. Uh, we are not learning problem solving. That is exactly what we are doing in this moment. And what is beautiful, uh, one of the things that we're doing with the National Parents Union is actually providing resources to families across the country um, so that they can develop their own ideas around homeschool pods or around uh, learning groups. Uh, things that we've always done, if you're poor, black or brown, resource sharing is just something that, that we do naturally. We, we share with one another, we're family. Uh, but now we're, we're being able to provide them with some additional resources. So the ideas that they have around uh, innovation and new ideas of, around how we teach kids while we're in this unprecedented moment, those things are still happening. So I, I want to caution us about approaching this from a deficit perspective by thinking that our, our kids, because we're going through a time of challenge, are somehow broken or, or are, are just never going to recover from this. Our kids are resilient, they are beautiful, they are bright, they are filled with hope. And we should be filled with hope and optimism too. Now we as the adults, we have to take the bull by the horn and say, we've got to do our best work to figure out what it is we're going to need to formally support them in an academic way. But we've got to approach this. We have so many and so many wonderful things that are happening and, and growing and blossoming from this moment. If we put on our kids the, the fact that, oh, this is so terrible and, and you're traumatized and you're never gonna get through this. They will never achieve proficiency, let alone excellence. There, there are still things to celebrate here. Yeah, just to clarify, the question was, how can we ensure that they develop more critical thinking or problem solving? That it doesn't, you know, that they don't have those things, but good point made anyway. Um, I was just, we just wanted to know if there tactics or ways that we can increase that, which we need for all Americans and in the Latino community to build on that inherent innovation and, and thinking that we have critical, you know, skills and, and, and problem solving that we have. But I'll go to a different one though. Um, how might we use innovative technologies to prepare students for a changing, evolving workforce? Um, and I want to go to Susan because I know our as a second language program is teaching 100,000 kids how to code and we're doing it virtually now all over the country. So Susan, what are your thoughts? I know you mentioned working with our friends at Apple. Um, do you wanna talk about that? Absolutely, and I think um, I just wanted to come on Robert for what he said, schools are not closed. They have changed from the classroom to the cloud. And I think that's really essential to, to remember as we go through all this, especially as we move into our innovative technology. We are a one-to-one, uh, -one, like I said, district. We are very, um, we have many girls who code clubs in our district, and so anybody can join those clubs. I have seen tremendous growth in our youngest learners as well as our seniors in high school with the way that they've been able to critically problem solve and handle the different scenarios that are placed in front of them with the code coding curriculum that we do have. Apple, again, has been a really strong partner with us. What we decided to do last year, and, and thankfully we did this without knowing what was ahead of us, we started tech clubs at the high school level where they were actually, the, 
the tech support groups. So they were problem solving how to solve what our IT department was solving as well. So how, why couldn't the student get into this program? Why couldn't the student log into our server? And they were actually writing codes for that so they could create a new app to create the actual tech help desk. So it's pretty amazing how we just presented them with the problem. They were able to problem solve, critically think through that. And then with the support of their teachers, they were able to create apps where they thought that that was something that only happened at Google or at Apple. And so they quickly learned that they are in that seat where they can do these things. And so it was an incredible transition that our students were able to experience firsthand. So I think with continuing to practice the coding adventures that we have, you know, right now, they can bring that to what they're doing every day. So it's really amazing what our students can do with that coding. Great, and Robert, do you wanna weigh in on that? Because I know teachers are getting more and more creative um, in, in preparing these students and teaching them right now. Well, one of the things that we've heard a lot from the business community um, when we transition from general standards into common core standards is the implementation or the um, integration of 21st century skills. We call it the soft skills that students need to enter within the business world. And I will tell you what this pandemic has in a way sort of forced us to do is expedite and elevate those 21st century skills from how we operate in so what quote unquote a business setting using a virtual platform. So everything from exposing the digital divide, which we have, the need for access to devices, Wi-Fi, but also how we interact in a digital platform and our students are having to learn. So they're operating in two different modes. It's I'm listening, I'm hearing what the instruction is, how do I transfer that into my learning? And then how do I upload my assignments? How do I move it forward? Those are all things that students could then use for when we enter into the workforce, whether they're building their own web pages, we're using Google Classroom slides, whether they're starting to um, look at editing videos. Uh, one of the great uh, teaching strategies you see a lot of educators using is screencasting. They record themselves, reading a story or novel. You can do it for kindergarten students. You can do it for high school students reading um, a, a, a House on Mango Street in middle school. We use that book, that novel. If whatever you're using, you can record it, then you pause it, you ask those critical thinking skills. Not just what happened in the beginning, middle of the end of the story, which is a good strategy for parents to do. Tell me what happened first, then what happened next. You're building those skill sets. You're predicting and inferring about what will happen next in the story? And then later you move to more sophisticated story about describe the character. Tell me more about what you see. Don't just tell me you like it. It's all of those conversations that you have that prepare students to think critically and how to respond. And this is a great way that, that guardians at home, that uh, parents who are there or older brothers and siblings can help Modeling effective language is the most appropriate strategy and very easy for everyone to Modeling reading a story, modeling how you do a presentation and how you answer questions. Many of our students now, I talk to my nephews, I say, how do you do it? They say, eh, they'll give you a short little response. We have to go back and educate our own about what are appropriate responses and how to use conversation in language. And you don't have to necessarily just do that in English. You can do it in Spanish as well. If you're twice exceptional and you have multiple skill sets, utilize them because they're effective in using in the business world as well. Thanks, Robert. Um, so I just wanna round it off with just some thoughts from Susan and Carrie as well on some ways that creative teaching and, and pedag pedagogical methods and curricula might be shifted to respond to this changing or changed realities. Um, very quickly, because we're about to go to the audience Q&A. And so um, if you want to weigh in on that, Carrie, and then Susan, and then Robert, if you want to weigh in as well. But real short answers, though, because we're about to jump over to the Q&A. And that also is a reminder for everyone in the audience, if you could please submit your questions. We have several already, but in case you want to get your questions answered by this amazing panel. Carrie? I think one of the things that we, we have to do is just understand the context of our students, our children, their families. And I think whatever innovative approaches we're coming up with and, and delivery models, I think the most important thing that we have to emphasize is the connection and the relationship building, the trust that has to be built between teacher and student, uh, between parents and teacher. All of us are on a team. So during this unprecedented moment, picking up the phone and, and making that phone call, that connection, 
What information do I have that I want the teacher to know about my babies? That can be very valuable. How are you going to be able to reach them? And what can I do as a parent? Parents desperately want to do anything we possibly can in this moment to help support our kids, whether it's on screen or off screen. So building those relationships, those trust based conversations that build to, towards a relationship uh, are key right now. So I, regardless of what we do, we, we cannot lose sight of the humanity and the fact that we've really Really got to make those connections and those are tricky especially during this time uh, of racial uprising in this country where we're confronting a lot of internal biases we have we've got to double down on that work because it doesn't matter what kind of innovative approach or curriculum you have if you don't believe in my child and i don't believe in you it, it really all starts there that, that's interesting at a time that we're socially distanced um, the connection is more important than ever, that humanity. So thank you for that, Carrie. Susan, you want to jump in on this? I, I do agree. It's that connection. And the connections that we make now will help us when we trans transition back into school buildings. I do think that when you're going back to the creativity, I do think that our students are now becoming their own teachers. And we have to acknowledge that as well because they're exploring and creating on their own. And so our teachers have to understand that, yes, it's a shared learning experience. It's not just what, you know, I give all the information to you, you understand all the information and produce a product. It's that shared leadership and, lead and learning that's going to occur. Yeah, and that's certainly going to help with the critical thinking and, and problem solving skills, right, that Carrie was talking about or inherently in terms of the situation. Robert, um, finish this one off and then we'll go to audience questions. I think the important thing to remember is that we're all in this together. So the word community, when we think about comunidad and la gente, about coming together, about familia, that's what it's going to take. It's, it's not just I send my kid to school and it's their job to educating. Educating is a community process. It's something that we all do together. And we all have to work as a team to uplift our community and make sure that our students are successful in, in, during this pandemic and even beyond in the future. Okay, so we're gonna go to audience questions and I'm gonna start with this one because I think this is a good one uh, in terms of doing this with CHCI. How can, this is Steve, ask, how can policymakers and educators work together to ensure Latino students and their families overcome challenges or prepared for success virtually this year? So what can policymakers, I think we're getting a sense for what educators can do. Any thoughts? And you don't all have to answer it. It's it, any of you that feel comfortable. Well, of course, from my lens, I would say engage families and engage community. Um, they're a critical stakeholder that I did not hear at that table. Um, policy can't just be done to us without us. And so it must be a co-creative, collaborative process where we're helping to really create those policies. I think we have a lot of really well-intended, smart people who are trying to develop best practices, but you don't have best practices unless we're in community with one another developing those. So I think listening closely to what families and what communities need, uh, they are closest to the pain. So if we're going to come up with effective solutions, engaging them in conversation and listening to their ideas, they may not have a master's degree or a doctorate in education, but they are experts on their kids and they're experts on their community. So it's a missed opportunity if you're not engaged with them. I also think it's essential that um, our community work with our legislators. They have to lobby. We know that in Congress, the House of Representatives, we passed the HEROES Act, and we have got to put pressure on the Senate and Mitch McConnell to get that stimulus package back because there's a lot of funding tied to our schools. Um, at the NEA, you know, we, we often get pushback people saying, well, education and politics should be separate. And unfortunately, we can't leave those decisions to those that aren't connected to the classroom, that aren't working with our students in our schools and our community. And one of the ways we like to tell the community to get involved is go to our website, educationvotes.org. Information is like oxygen. We need it to breathe and survive. And the more we can put in the hands of our community, the more we can get folks involved, the, the longer they will hear us, and we will get some effective change for our students and our community, for the Latino population. Yeah, they have to work hand in hand, right? So um, are you aware, this is Ruben um, Abarca. Are you aware of university initiatives to help Latinx high school or middle school students get involved in STEM at an earlier age? Of course, besides the programs that we run as well and as other organizations are doing. Um, but Susan, you want to kick that off? 
Yeah. Yes, there, we, our universities here in New Mexico are very much involved with the STEM and it's actually streamed now, it, what they're calling it in our state. And so what they're really helping us do is support those programs like botball competitions. They're also supporting the STEM challenge where they're giving scholarships to teach to students who do um, win those prizes at the STEM challenges. So they are focusing their efforts on, on that avenue. I think uh, one thing that we can do better is really understand both worlds Sometimes there's this big disconnect between public schools and higher education and how we're preparing our teachers for what classrooms are gonna be coming into tomorrow. I think we you know, need to build those stronger partnerships so that teachers do understand when they graduate with their undergraduate degrees, what today's education system looks like. Because sometimes what they think it looks like is not really what's happening in the schools because of the changes that are occurring every day. You know, Antonio, the other thing that, that I, yes, the other thing that I think is really important in that question is the connection to middle school. A lot of times we wait till the student is in high school to start thinking about what's that next step and beyond. But really with you, you have to start thinking in middle school, plant those seeds of, am I interested in this? And that's where having STEM cell programs in the middle school level, and you think it's an interest or it could be a disinterest, you might not like it, and you choose another pathway, that's okay. But we want students to start exploring that in middle school so that they work towards in high school and they're prepared to be competitive when we get into higher education. And I completely agree, agree with Susan, this has to be a conversation that is fluid all throughout the various levels of education, from pre-K all the way into higher education. And it's interesting too, because we actually did a study with the Student Research Foundation and found that there was a, a gap in confidence uh, the confidence is is a real gap in terms of um, STEM, uh, keeping going with with the interest in STEM. That it's still aspirational. It's not an it's not an opportunity op, uh, problem. It's actually a confidence problem, especially among Latinas. So um, that is something to keep in mind as well as is building that confidence as you go forward. And that's and includes I role. I was just going to say, I think it's really key. Obviously, I'm going to come with the family and community angle again, but <laughs> overcoming a lot of family perceptions and community right. perceptions about yeah. whether or not STEM is for us, like that is work that has to happen with families and community. I, I don't know about you guys, but in my family, it was be done with school as quick as possible. You need to get a job. And girls don't do that. Um, overcoming um, that that mindset in our own community, in our own families, that takes engagement. That team, that takes a lot of work with us, so that we're helping to build their confidence. We can be key players in this. So don't forget us. Yeah, and there's this great show on Netflix, by the way, that that's called The Expanding Universe of Ashley Garcia with amazing Paulina Chavez. But even those shows, she plays a STEM hero, like this genius. Uh, teenager that's in high school that works for NASA. Um, so I, those things all count. So let me ask this too, because this is a great question, I think, from Steve again. What are we hearing from students themselves about both their challenges and what they'd like to see in their education now and going forward? So um, getting that read from the actual students, I think, is always the most important thing than us kind of projecting onto them what they should prioritize or what they need. Um, so um, we can start that off with Robert, Susan, Kerry. So two of the things that I hear from students quite often is one, I wish I knew sooner. Sometimes it, it happens so late that the opportunity isn't there, which, which really leads to the second one, which I think is the leading one, it's access and opportunity. And that's really where we have to increase. We have to bridge that equity and get barrier gap. So when we provide those opportunities within our public schools for students to be exposed to STEM classes, whether it's during the day, whether it's part of an after school program, whether there's enrichment that it takes them into field trips. Those are learning educational opportunities that help them explore and exposes them to opportunities and opens your mind up into greater opportunities. And the sooner we can start those for students, the greater we spark that interest, that drive and that desire, and that we see more of Latinos as astronauts, as engineers, as inventors, as developers, because we have them, we're there. We've been doing it for centuries now, but we want to see more and more of them. So those are the two I would highlight. Great. And Susan Robert, and Karen. I absolutely 
Yeah, Robert, I absolutely agree. I was just thinking of myself as a young learner and I had no idea what computer science was and what coding was. When I went to college at New Mexico State, I remember the computer science building being this really cold, freezing building and these are my classmates would go and they would put all these codes in the computer and I thought oh my gosh who would want to do that but you know if I had been exposed much earlier to what the whole world of steam and stem looked like maybe I would have been that student that was that was um, really excited about being in technology because as a young Latina in my community that wasn't the opportunity presented itself. And so that's what I really wanna see for our kids, especially because I live in the community that I grew up in and I want our students to be exposed to what's out there because many of our students, they don't leave our small community. They don't know what the world is outside of Los Angeles, New Mexico. They're lucky if they go to Albuquerque. And so I think it's really the exposure and really taking them on those virtual field trips to know, yeah, you can go to the Louvre and it's it's out of this country and you can go to California. You can take that field trip. It doesn't take, um, take you to, you have to get on a flight and you have to fly or you have to drive your car. That exposure can change some, some child's life more than you will ever know. And it's, it's, it's really important that we expose our students. So thank you, Robert, for saying that. And, and, and I just want to say, what I'm, what I'm hearing from my babies in this house is that uh, they want more educators that look like them and understand them. That is so important. My children had a transformative experience this summer on Zoom, uh, going to Freedom School for the first time. First time they ever had black and brown teachers in their whole lives. 80% of educators are white and they couldn't believe it. And they were so excited. Uh, there were no explanations necessary. They were able to show up as their full selves. They were understood. Um, and that belief gap that we face in education, the idea that you know certain kids, because they're a certain color or, or come from a certain economic background, that they're not capable of proficiency, let alone excellence, that's something we need to confront. And to watch my children light up being educated by people who look like them and being so excited about that. And it opened up their minds. You want to talk about opening up the world of possibility. Um, just having educators that reflect them. Uh, my, my youngest son went up five reading levels this summer through a virtual literacy academy from the Center for Black Educator Development. It was extraordinary, life changing for him, and they can't stop talking about it. Um, so. I don't know, for my, for my babies, that, that was it, that they want to see more educators that look like them and, and certainly are excited about that prospect in the future. That's very powerful. That's, that's as good as a statistic gets, right? Five reading levels. Um, so what are your thoughts regarding or experiencing in your own lives um, imposter syndrome? And I, I think this is interesting, too, in terms of seeing it in your own life and then seeing it in the classroom where you see some of the kids that uh, might excel and all of a sudden they shy away uh, from that success uh, to fit in or because they they, they maybe not are comfortable in that space. So um, Robert, do you start that off, please? So uh, this is really interesting question because I sat there and I thought about it for a second and you're right, it does happen where, where um, Students might think it's not cool to be maybe that one student in the coding class or the computer science. And I'll be really honest with you, we need to take that on right away. We need to be very candid with students. When I get a student that comes from El Barrio and he wants to hang out with his only friends because you know he's the goody-goody or the one that goes to school, we need to cut that and start having conversations because what they are are role models in the community and they're building a pathway for other students to see what it's like to come to school. Um, and one of the good ways that we do in help, helping with that is getting involved in the community, is being out there, um, walking kids home to and from school, having conversations with folks in the neighborhood. That helps bring people together and make it a hub so that it's an opening environment. Uh, we have really good opportunities to do that um, in high school level. We use sports, but we could also use fine arts and clubs to draw students in. And we have to be bold and lead with example and have crucial conversations with our family, students, and community and let them know what the opportunity they have. They may not see um, educators and professionals that look like them, but that doesn't mean that they can't be the first one and they can't be the ones to be the, to create opportunities for others. I always tell students I was the first person in my family to go to college and I am not going to be the last one. 
all of my nieces and nephews will go forward and I don't care what they do, but we are moving forward and we're gonna have more Latinas in schools. And that's exactly the message we have to send to our students is that this posture syndrome, we have can control that and we can dispel it by cutting it off right away, empowering our students to lead, working with them, but letting them know that they have a responsibility to their community, to their family, to build those pathways and be leaders among the Latinos. Inspirational cue. Uh, Susan, did you want to weigh in on that? That's, that's a hard act to follow, Robert. So inspiring. I think that we have talked about, um, it, somebody alluded to it, the social emotional learning aspect. I, I, I do not think we can forget that. I think it starts with being able to tell our students, it's okay to tell us how you feel. It's okay to tell us that you feel like you're the odd person out. It's okay to express your feelings because sometimes they're not able to do that um, for, for various reasons. Who knows? We don't know. And so I think along those lines, we really have to help educate them on what is this imposter syndrome? What does it mean? Why are you feeling this this um, feeling that you're you're the goody two shoes in the class and you're the one that comes to school and your peers do not? And, and that is very real. It is a very real feeling for a lot of our students, whether they're Latinas, Latinos, it's it's real for all of our students, I think, because they don't want to feel left out. We're humans. We want to have that connection that was alluded earlier. We want to be a part of our society. We want to feel that we belong. And so anytime that we're going to put in a position where we don't belong or where we feel like we don't belong, I think we start to go towards what we feel more comfortable with. So Robert, I think you said it perfectly and what an inspiration. Carrie? Well, I feel like I could give a master class on imposter syndrome. I'm a former foster kid who got expelled from public high school. I got my GED from Boston Public Schools. Uh, I scratched and clawed my way to college. It was the great shame of my life, uh, my young early life and, and what I went through. So any space I enter, like even just sitting here with you, like what, what am I doing here? Uh, but I was always an organizer. Uh, now, when I was that age and I was young, I used to organize, you know, a group of girls to go get in a fight. Now I use my organizing skills for good. Uh, but, you know, through that, you know, the fact that, you know, so many parents that are, are, are stepping up and trying to fight for, for our kids, we are survivors of our own public education experience. We have been, we've had it beat into us uh, that uh, we're not good enough. Uh, we're not smart enough. We don't know enough. We don't care about our kids enough. Um, and what we do is organize these mothers who are working so hard, these fathers who are working multiple jobs, doing everything that they possibly can to fight to get their kids an easier life than they have, that they're important, um, that they belong in these conversations, they're needed in these conversations, that it, it doesn't matter how much money you have, how, what kind of educational pedigree you have, where you came from, these are our children. And we all have a common goal towards getting them equitable outcomes, which which is just a better future and a brighter life. And they belong in these spaces. So we deal with imposter syndrome every single day. We build backbone here, that parents are needed, our context is needed, uh, because you can't get this done for kids without community coming together and being willing to engage with a system that for many of us left us behind, that pushed us out, that failed us, uh, without any restorative justice, uh, with the expectation that we come back and, and try to engage in the ways uh, that they want us to, again, in a system that is 80, like, uh, again, 80% of our educators are white um, and, and so much is stacked against us. So we try to do what we can in the National Parents Union to transform that. Parents don't need to be empowered. Parents are powerful. We just need to show up and, and overcome some of that confidence so we can be a part of the team. Folks, folks need to be a part of this conversation if we're really going to get it done for kids. Thank you, Marina, for asking that great question. So um, this is a good question. Uh, do any of the panelists have a sense about what new educational technologies may be coming down the road soon to enhance learning inside and outside the classroom? Have you guys heard of anything that people are working on or, or where it might go from here? Uh, because this isn't going away anytime soon. Um, and I know that there was a big difference in terms of my own kids, uh, how they were being educated in the spring compared to now in the fall when we've had some time to prepare. Do you see anything being prepared now going forward? So I will uh, tell you I, what I do see. Oh, go ahead, Susan. No, it's okay, Robert. Go ahead. So The only uh, thing I was going to mention. 
Susan. Robert, go ahead. No, no, no go ahead, Robert. So the one thing I was going to mention that we do notice is a change in software. That's really evolving and it changes all the time. I will tell you that um, having multiple devices is becoming sort of the way in which you can operate both in broadcasting as well as you know uploading assignments and learning. So both from educator to student, that sort of connection piece. I will tell you that um, our phones are becoming increasingly sophisticated. And this is what I think when we think about what the future is and how it's evolving, we are now being able, we can now use our cell phones to scan while a student is reading and being able to screencast that while I'm teaching a lesson, have you use your phone to go ahead and screen what you're learning so that we're doing, so you switch from asynchronous to synchronous instruction. So doing it not live, but live at the same time. And so I think that that's kind of what you will see more of in this coming year. So while while learning right now clearly is two dimensional, so I'm over here, it might be a Google slide, it might be that I'm broadcasting right now, it's really going to be synchronous and happening uh, between student and educator. Thank you. And Susan? Robert, I absolutely agree. I was just going to say that it's the use of multiple devices. One device is not enough anymore because of the amount of information that our students are able to digest, produce, and then submit. And they're really, I think um, I have my godchildren, they are very big fans of TikTok and what they've done on TikTok and how they've implemented that into our learning management systems and how they've been able to broadcast and really um, out, you know, start to shine. They've really built their confidence through that. And so the things that they do with TikTok and multiple devices have really blown me away. And they've also incorporated gaming. They're big gamers. So how has right. that changed? Because they're, they're moving so fast. These games are, are just unreal. They're so, they, they look like real life. And there's a lot of critical thinking and problem solving that are involved in these games. And so our students, they're, they're in a very fast world in their minds. You know, it's the next thoughts already in there before you've even thought about it. So I, I do think with those multiple devices and the speed of our world, that's gonna definitely impact our learning. Except none of that works if you don't have access to technology and to, Wi-Fi. Exactly. So let me just say that's exactly. something I've always called the tech equity gap. You know, there's an equity yeah. gap in education and workforce development because of it. Carrie, wrap us up and then we'll go to uh, closing um, this panel out. Yeah, I, I want to say one of the most innovative things I'm seeing right now is choice and options. Oh my gosh, you're not just presented with one box, get in it, that's all we have. Now, all of a sudden, the world is our oyster. We have lots of different things to select. And if something's not working for your child, you do have the option to choose something else. Um, and that is, is something we've never seen. I mean, we have held tight to a status quo that clearly has not been working for our kids for generations, saying that this is, the, this is the way we have to do it. It's the only way it can get done. Nothing can change, like the system's too big. Well, we were presented with an unprecedented situation and guess what? everything's changing. It is possible to pivot. It is possible to innovate. It is possible to change with the times. And I think just the fact that that idea has been introduced, whew, that's a game changer. Absolutely. So we're going to stay with you, Carrie, and we're going to close this out. Um, so if each of you to just share a final thought in a minute, um, please l let us know what you would want us to leave with after this panel. Uh, Carrie, please go first, and then we'll go to Susan and then to Robert. Uh, the thing I want to say is that we must absolutely have an equity-infused educational recovery. Uh, there's no doubt about it. It must be based in equity, not equality where everybody gets the same thing. There were a lot of children, Latino children, who started well, well before the starting line. We were already trying so desperately to catch up after years, generations of systemic racism being underserved. We were already starting out behind the eight ball. We need an equity infused educational recovery con concentrated around the kids uh, that have incredible assets that they bring to the table, but are going to need extra help and support. Understanding the context of, of community and what we're expecting of parents who are themselves survivors of public education, confronting uh, the fact that we do have a technology gap. 
we, we do have a technology divide and parents are going to need support. They're going to need their own professional development if we're going to be the facilitators of K through six education. We've got to show up for our parents so that they can show up for the kids and make this stuff possible. So we've got to make sure that in all of these conversations, we are focused on equity and that we are making sure Latino kids are not left behind. Great, Susan? I think that we really need to also understand that our children are watching everything that we do right now. We're their models. And what we do today is going to impact their futures tomorrow. The decisions that we make today, the technology, the equity, everything that we do, our arguments that we have, I know we're very divided amongst our country right now. I think that our children are watching and we need to come to some type of agreement where we come together as a team because that has a great impact on the equity, the Wi-Fi, the, as you said, Antonio, the inequality with technology access. I think that we have to work together and we've got to get it done for our kids. There's no other way. Thank you, Susan. Robert. So I wanted to close with the mission for the National Education Association. Our mission is to advocate for education professionals and to unite our members and the nation to fulfill the promise of public education and to prepare every student to be successful in a diverse and interdependent world. And that's something that's very near and dear to our hearts. And we wanna remind our community that we can't do that alone. This is a difficult time for everyone, for parents, for students, and for educators. And this is an opportunity to come together and show our collective power. Lobby the Senate to pass as a house, the, the um, house bill on uh, the HEROES Act. It's also a way to address student loan debt. We want that pipeline between our students to go from pre-K into higher education and become successful. We have to address all levels of the inequalities and the barriers that exist. This pandemic has really brought to light the huge injustice that we see within our public schools and in our community. And we can't go back to letting that continue. We must put a stop to it and we have to work together. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I want to say thank you again to all of you. Carrie Rodriguez, Susan Chavez, and Robert Rodriguez, thanks to all of you for those pearls that you just threw at us. I learned um, just even moderating this panel. And your passion is so important because you're going to keep things going back into your communities. For everyone else, please keep tweeting about the conference at hashtag CHCIHHM20. We encourage you to attend the sessions the rest of the day and the week. And now that you've registered, you can attend any session you want. To find a session you're interested in, go to www.chcihhm.org backslash agenda. If you know people that would be interested in the conference but haven't signed up yet, you can encourage them just to go to www.chcihhm.org and click on the register button. We'd also love it if you would attend the gala celebration on Monday. It's going to be sensational, September 21st from 6 to 8. Go to the same conference website, click on the gala tab, and you'll have to register separately. But from what I understand, you will be very entertained. It'll be festive, and we can celebrate our culture, our achievements, and our vision going forward. So thank you again, CHCI, for having us, and I appreciate the panel and everyone that was listening in. Thanks, Marco.